We are live, live, live from New York City. Actually not, but at least in the same time zone. Uh, live, live from Reading. So, uh, all right, I'm feeling a little bit better than I did yesterday. Yesterday, I had some weird low energy in the day before too, which usually isn't me. I usually have a lot more energy, but um, oh well. It is what it is. So today is a new day. Today it's uh, almost 5 o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m. I've been up for probably about three, four hours now, three hours, I guess. Um, and uh, today's a good day. It's my birthday. So it is what it is. 40 years ago. Wow, can you believe it? Hmm. Uh, this is a good day. This is a good day. So I found this artist, uh, well I didn't find him, It was he was sent to me. Don Guillermo, aka Bill Jordan, from the Academy of Composition, found this artist and sent him, sent him over to me. I took a look at his work, fascinating work, beautiful work he has. Uh, his name is Rosario uh, Piazza and he's from Naples, Italy, I think he lives in uh, Texas now. and. Uh, I did a, a short, I did a video on him yesterday, but my internet went out, and so I'm re-recording the Core 80 call number four, which then also means I have to still do number five today, which I will, and uh, I might give you guys a little treat. I actually might just take one or two of my own drawings, analyze them. Uh, well, not really analyze them, but you know, share them with you, uh, and uh, how I think, how I'm designing it, just because it is my birthday. So it's been a it's been a very interesting two years since uh, my 38th birthday, which in a weird way seems older than 40. But anyways, um, it's been a it's been a journey over the last two years. Um, Two years ago, I had everything just basically ripped away from me. It was insane. Uh, relationships, uh, money, houses, cars. Uh, I got my my uh, place robbed, so all my computer equipment was stolen. Uh, it was just a very insane uh, moment in my life. And... Uh, uh, and it all happened within about a week to two weeks of each other, which was very strange. It just was like everything was stripped. And um, and now here we are two years later, you know, a very, very different place. Um, and feeling very, very grateful, and very, very thankful, very, very happy. Um, the Academy is growing. Uh, you know, sometimes what I've learned is that life will test you to see if you're really, really committed to your purpose. And, you know, some people in this world, they run after, you know, money. Some people, some guys run after getting laid. Uh, as they say, most men are either focused on getting laid or getting paid. And um, getting some honey or some money, as they say. <laughs> uh, and you know, both of those things are really, really good stuff. Really good stuff. But um, I'm a strange cat. Ever since I was a little kid, money didn't really attract me. Sex was cool one day I'd have it, but it never really was my driving motive. Uh, you know, motive. But becoming a, a significant player in the realm of art has always motivated me. Um, leaving a mark, leaving a legacy, 
uh, has always motivated me. And so I'm, I'm very purpose-driven. And even though it's, it's strange, a lot of people in my life, they often will, will look at my ideas and say, oh, you have a new idea, you have a new idea, you have a new idea. And I kind of scratch my head a little bit because I'm like, well, you know, since I was 12 years old, I kind of had the same ideas, right? <laughs> um, just trying to figure them out, you know, how to manifest them, how to actualize them, how to live them out, how to make them real. Because they're not little ideas, they're very, very big ideas. And, um, and the reality is the conventional wisdom, uh, common sense, is not designed for these ideas. And so uh, uh, I've had to try to figure them out. But luckily, life has been gracious and brought people like uh, Costanza in my life and uh, Bill Jordan in my life, uh, wise souls to kind of help me along this path. And um, just feel very, very grateful for those two people. Uh, a whole bunch of other people, you know, my best friend Daniel, shout out to Danny Dan. Uh, my dear, dear friend Orlando, um, I say Orlando taught me a great lesson, and that is every person who calls himself spiritual should have a solid relationship with a beautiful atheist. And the conversations that you have will really, really test your faith. Uh, it will help you burn a lot of the crap out of your faith. And it will really help you strengthen your faith. And after 20 years, uh, my strength, my faith has grown and his atheism has grown. So we've helped each other. <laughs> um, so anyways, there's, it, it's been a beautiful last two years, even though it's been a tough last two years. And just keeping focused on, on what, what, what the purpose is, which is to bring composition, to bring design uh, back to the forefront of art. My vision is that the language of design becomes the common language of art again, the common experience, not only for the art makers, but the art lovers. And that is my purpose on this planet. Uh, there's different ways, different vehicles that I want to uh, do that. Right now I'm focusing on coaching and training students uh, at some point, I'd love, not I'd love to, but I will, um, figure out how to bring this information to the orphans uh, and the fatherless kids around the world, because that is very, very dear to my heart. Um, when my, my father passed away when I was five, uh, it was art that saved my soul, if you will. And, um, uh, and if it wasn't for art and design, uh, I wouldn't be... It wouldn't be me. It's just that simple. So it became my dad. It became my friend. It became uh, my guiding coach, uh, my mentor, if you will. And we, Art and I, have had a, an amazing relationship. And we've won a lot of awards together. We got a lot of accolades together. Uh, and in reality, like, it's probably my longest relationship. You know, 40 years old today, I've been very intimate with art for almost 35 years. And I have memories even before that. You know, my brother, uh, Miguel, used to draw Porky Pig when we were kids. Uh, when, my, when my little brother, Jason, was, you know, one, whatever, years old, and he would wet the, you know, he'd pee his diaper, wet his bed or whatever. Um, my older brother Miguel would draw a little porky pig, you know, and that was very profound for me. I was only maybe two and a half, three years old um, at the time, but it was significant because I might have been a year older than that, and Jason might have been a year older, but anyways, it was significant because it taught me that Art could tell stories. Art could have a personal connection with people. 
uh, it could bind and, and, and there was a magic to it. And so that was my first experience with art was the fact that you would make these marks on paper, you would draw this image, but it related to us as humans in our experience in our life. And so that became the foundation of my art, which is very much about storytelling and connecting with humans. It's also given me a filter that when I look at art, I look for story. Not necessarily narrative, but a story, an idea is being conveyed to connect with humans. And over the years, uh, thanks to the wonderful work, uh, the life work of Myron Barnstone um, and the students that came out of the Barnstone Studios, uh, which I was so graciously, uh, well, so luckily, I should say, um, uh, permitted to be part of that group. And I met Myron back when I was 17, I guess, 17. Um, and it's been a very interesting journey with him and learned a lot and absolutely grateful for my time with, with uh, Myron. So, but what Myron helped me do is begin to see art from the perspective of design, composition and and now what I get to do is teach people how to speak design and communicate story and uh, and there's very very few people out there who do that I constantly hear that I'm the only one who does that um, and if that's the case then the responsibility to make sure that this uh, information is one teachable that I can uh, synthesize this down and, and, and refine this information down so I can train more people a lot of people then that's a great response uh, responsibility and one that I take on with uh, immense joy and, uh, and, and immense care because it breaks my heart to know that we've lost a hundred years of profound art We've lost it to, to a very, I'm going to say it, very stupid idea that design doesn't matter. That we can create art out of arbitrary chaos. And, you know, just being arbitrary, being random, being chaotic, uh, and hoping things happen. And uh, reality is, is that much more of life is designed to work together. It's loved, it's, it's communed, it's communicating together. You just spend, you go out into nature and just sit there, you know? There's, there's some chaos in it, but the, but the fact is the, the majority of it isn't chaos. Things work beautifully together, beautifully together. You know, I, I, I so often think about men and women and how, you know, here's one creature over here and here's another creature over there and yet um, there's so many things about the design of the human body, about the, uh, the design of the human emotions and how like puzzle pieces we just fit together so well. Um, and I, that, just, that just boggles my mind. I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. And so that's the way we approach our art making. We approach it like a puzzle. We, are, we approach it like a riddle. We're trying to figure out this language, trying to figure out how to communicate effectively through visual language. And that language is called design. So let me share some beautiful work by uh, Rosario Piazza. He's a living artist. Uh, he's living in Texas, I believe now. He's originally from Naples, Italy. And he was classically trained in the apprentice system. I think he had a couple different maestros, maestros, uh, masters. And, um, but let me show you his work. He tells uh, neat stories, but his design work is, is just gorgeous. Very, very, just very, very beautiful work. So I'm going to spend a little extra time on this video, uh, as long as the internet doesn't go out again, <laughs> um, because I want to show you five of his paintings. And Rosario, if you get to watch this video, 
I hope that uh, I do you justice. I hope that I do your teachers justice and your school and your history and the traditions that you've come from. Uh, and if I come to Texas and you would like to break open a bottle of wine, some Chianti, or have some some coffee, uh, I'd love to meet up with you and just hear your stories because your artwork uh, impresses me and I'm not impressed by very much. So let us jump in and take a look at your work. Now we already saw this image, oops, uh, we already saw this painting in um, the video I did earlier, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just for this new video, I'll go through it again. Uh, so when I see this painting, obviously it's bringing me on a journey down this uh, alley or this small street. And the question is, is how does it bring me on that journey? I mean, I can look at it and say, well, it's an alley. I'm supposed to walk down that street. But see, a master composer doesn't uh, put up images and then have you, you know, think to yourself, well, I'm supposed to do this. They're actually going to, to take your eye and lead you through the journey. And so how, how does that work? How does this image, how, how is this image designed in a way that actually does that? And so what my eye picks up on when I look at this image, what I see are, are relationships of what we're going to call horizontal and verticals. Now, there really is only one vertical in this image. Um, all the others are really diagonals, but we're just going to call them vertical thrusts, okay, and horizontal thrusts um, because they're just moving us from the left to the right or from the top to the bottom, all right? Um, so, Here's what I see when I see this image. If we start at the top left hand corner, because that's how we read, and we move across, we come to the edge of the building, which is really your dominant vertical. And so our eye comes down, and then at the bottom, it goes across horizontally. Yes, it's still, it's like on a slight angle, but let's just say horizontal. Um, and there's like this step or this dark area that creates a line that moves our eye across the walkway. Now, once it gets to the walkway, you can see the green vegetations up on an angle. The whole building is kind of slanted on an angle, which is interesting. But uh, our eye travels up there and then it comes across horizontally and then back down and then across and up and back down and, I mean, and then across again and so on until it gets all the way back to this spot in the background. Now I'm going to take these lines away so now you can see the image again. And now begin to see how your eye moves through this piece. Now what's really pretty is I like how Rosario um, puts a dark value, a shadow, it's casting a shadow onto the wall on both sides and yet all the way in the back there's like this little triangle of light area. I, I, I find that gorgeous because it's like leading you down this alley and, and, it, and there's a, a beginning which is where we're standing and then there's a middle which is the dark area of the alley, the part that's in the shadow, that's the journey and then the destination is this, is this triangular wedge of light. And so, uh, so you really do feel like you're going on this journey, you're telling this story, you're having this sensation of walking down this little, these little cramped uh, streets. And it's just beautiful. It's really, really cool. Great job, man. Thank you. So here's an interesting... Um, an interesting uh, image. Now, the w image that you're looking at, I actually modified, and I want to show you why I did that, um, and then I'll show you uh, his original. But 
There's a concept that was shared to us at the Academy by Costanza called the Dragon's Eye. And the, and the idea of the Dragon's Eye is when these uh, Asian artists would paint their dragons. The painting would be good, but until you just put this little, maybe cast light or this little color in the eye of the dragon, it, it wasn't really alive until that moment. And when you put that little mark, it just activates, it unlocks the richness of the colors, of the design. And that's what happens here. So right now, this is a nice painting. But once I show you his original, and you'll see this slight little modification, all of a sudden, the, the image becomes activated. So here we go. Did you see that? Take a look at this little, I'm gonna call it a little girl down here, okay? This is the original. Look at the saturation of these greens of the uh, orange, the red orange inside the, uh, whatever the person's wearing, the jacket. When we bring this light value in the little girl and this pink, color, this high point of uh, saturation and this, this uh, light value together, it causes the darks around it to go darker and it also triggers the color to respond differently. So once we remove it, you can see how everything in the area of that little, that little grill kind of just like goes quiet, right? So when I bring it back, look at that little area. Boom, she pops, and then all of a sudden, the blues and the greens all become alive. The greens in the tree uh, up near the city, you, you, you could feel the light shining on them. Once you take that away, all of a sudden, everything just kind of begins to quiet down. When I bring it back, all of a sudden, all the colors, all the trees, all, everything just begins to become alive again. So the point is uh, that I want to share with you in terms of designing a piece is that sometimes it can just be the slightest littlest thing. This is why we are intentional. We're not arbitrary when we compose our artwork. We're just not random and haphazard because a little mark, a wrong mark or the absence of the right mark can make or break the painting. And why would you want to spend, you know, anywhere from three to 30 hours on a painting and not have it work properly? Okay? I mean, this, you're, you're communicating something that's in your soul. You either, you know, you're at this place and you have an experience with it and you want to share that with your audience. So you got to figure out what is the experience that you're having, you know? Uh, did he, when he was there in the midst of all of this uh, information, you got the city in the back, you got the fishermen out, you got the boats, it's like a little, a little uh, village. Kind of reminds me of the Sam, Sam Cook song, you know, down by the river, you know, uh, was born in a little tent. <laughs> kind of reminds me of that song. Um, and, uh, but you bring in that light value, that high saturation, and all of a sudden the image comes alive. So that's all I wanted to show you on that one. But it really, what it does, it, what, for me what it shows me is, is how much thinking Rosario is putting into these images. He's just not allowing it to happen, okay? now. He's well trained, and you know, 30 years later after being well trained, it could look like he allows it to happen because the calculations he's very familiar with, and the calculations are happening at such a speed. But in reality, his mind is really, really, really calculating this stuff, uh, at least subconsciously. And I'm sure because of his training, it is absolutely consciously calculating as well. This is a neat little painting. I like this, this little old lady with her donkey. <laughs> it's a very simple painting. 
And you can say, oh, well, you know, I like the little buildings and the hill and the little lady and her donkey. Great, cool. You've just named all the nouns. But when you read the design, it tells you the verb. It tells you what's actually going on in the piece. And so uh, we're just going to take a look at our thrust map and lay it over top of this design and then we'll go from there. So this is what I see when I see this image. Okay, I see a dominant vertical which comes right in line with the edge of that wall. It comes up with the, in line with the building and then it comes to that apex of the, uh, of the uh, mountain where the mountain basically shifts its diagonal, right? It creates a point. It comes down through the woman and the donkey and actually you can even see a dark mark in the road. So this line actually extends almost the entire uh, height of the painting. Now across here you'll see a roof. I'm looking at the horizontal line now. You'll see a roof on the left hand side. You'll come across and then you'll see a, a, a really distinct value shift. Dark underneath that line, light green on top of that line. Let me show you what I, what, I, what I mean. So you can see the contrast of dark to light or light to dark and then it comes across and creates a line uh, maybe the top of a building or something but bottom line that becomes your strongest diagonal, I mean horizontal in the piece. It's a beautiful horizontal thrust. So now we have a vertical and a horizontal thrust and now let's take a look at some diagonals. Okay. So we have a diagonal that comes through the bottom of the wall and we have this beautiful diagonal that forms the edge of the mountain or the hill. It even comes up and forms the bottom of the trees. That's intentional. That's not accidental. So let's take a look at the angle of the wall. That comes up and actually converges where our horizontal, our vertical, and now our diagonal meet. It's also leading us basically up towards this building on the left hand side with the door. Now, if we come back down to the little the, the, the old lady and we see a curve, the curve because there's a value shift, there's a curve in the road. And if we follow that curve, it comes up through the bushes, up through the trees, comes around and actually curves up over top and then through the little tree here basically leading us right back into that little door. How simple is that? How, but how beautiful it is. Now I'm going to take the, the image away so you can see how your eye is moving through through this space. Look at how that curve meanders around. I'm going to take it away. Now do you see it? Do you, do you feel how that is moving your eye through that piece? So these are all intentional things. Um, and they're all helping to tell a story. They're all helping to move our eye so that we can actually experience parts of the story and parts of the artwork in a very unique way. So let's go to number four. I really, really like this. I'm going to show you two um, uh, things that he's doing. Uh, two, two images, uh, one with straight lines, one with curves. So the straight line here is, is, uh, is like this. That little group of people actually are created inside of a square. So if you look at the bottom of the uh, cart of the, with a horse and you look at the wall and you come across it to the top of the horse, it come, that, that, har, that horizontal line comes straight, at, straight across and actually it boxes it box in these, these little these people. And I like how the lady on, in the blue all the way to the right, she's carrying like one of those things, a little basket on her head or something as, as they're walking forward. Um, and I like that the... I like that the basket is above her head and above that line. Now, if we look at the verticals, you see inside of the width of that, that square, you see all those vertical 
those trees, I mean, they're just vertical thrusts, vertical lines pulling us down on top of the people. Okay, so what, what he's telling us basically is when your eye gets into that area, he wants you to pull, up, he wants your eye to come down on top of the people. Okay, um, I'm going to take this image away so that you can begin to see how these vertical thrusts work bringing us there. And then the cart with the horse and all that stuff is used to bring us across to the people as well. Now let's take a look at some curves. You can see in the road there are a light area and dark area. There's blue and there's almost like a brown. And what's beautiful is he uh, creates this beautiful ring. You can see it how, it, how it's flowing through this image. And then if you look very closely in the back here to, towards the bottom left, you can again see this ring these rings of tones. By tones, I mean light and dark, okay? So I'm gonna take that away so you can see it. Look at the road. Look at the road in connection with the sidewalk. And you can begin to see how these curves are starting to move you through uh, the road and the sidewalk. It's really, really subtle, but really, really beautiful. Now let, let's take a look at the sky. We can see this beautiful curve in the left hand part of the trees. It's coming over the trees and then it comes up, comes across into the wall, swings back around through the trees and ultimately comes back down. So you can see that. Now let's go ahead and take that away. Now when you're looking at it, now that you see that curve, it almost, this image becomes more three-dimensional. I mean, you're starting to perceive the space, literally, the air, the, the volume, the weight of this sky, of this, of this space that these people are walking through and this, these carts are walking through. It, it's really, really nice. Very, very nice, actually. Now there's one more curve that I want you to see. And that curve is in the center of the sky. If you look to the right and to the left, you can see that the sky is cool and that it's of a, you know, a certain level of gray. But there's a wedge in the middle which turns warm because there's a cloud there, it turns warm. And it also drops in value. It's not as dark as the ones on the side. Do you see that? When I take it away, do you see that kind of bending triangle that leads us down to this uh, place where everybody's going? There we are. So this is, in my opinion, just a very, very successful piece. It's a, a wonderful piece. We feel like we're part of this group that's wa uh, walking towards wherever they're going. Um, yeah. Rosario did a, an amazing job on this one. Very, very nice. Now, this is one of my favorite paintings of his. It's very much like a Mondrian painting because you have all these beautiful rectangles and you've just taken the time to order and compose this thing out. Um, but what I really want to focus on with this image is his use of light, not, not light, um, his use of temperature, warm and cool, okay? You can see in the sky to, on the right hand side it's a very saturated blue and it's very cool. But as you move, as, as you, when you look to the left hand side, it's lighter in value and it's much warmer. Okay? So the majority of this painting is actually done in warm colors, uh, a warm temperature. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so here's a little map. You can see the C represents cool, the W represents warm. Now, because the contra I mean, because of the saturation of the sky and, and the main area of the image in terms of the cool and the warm, they're very low intensity. 
meaning uh, the, the little circle with the line that you see, the circle actually is a neutral gray. It, has, it really has no color lean to it, right? And so now when, when you take that gray and you start adding a little more saturation to it, it moves the, the little line, the indicator, up and down. So you can see on the left hand side that the sky and the majority of the painting are low intense, cool and warm relationships. But when you get to that center block where that wall is where you walk into the, into the, into the house, that's a much higher saturation of a blue green. So it's not blue, it's much more of a blue green because you don't want to take your soloist, which is the warm orange door, and begin to dilute its power because you brought in a blue next to it. Because blue will make either brown or gray depending on how you mix it, okay? Um, and blue meaning blue in relationship to the orange will make a brown or a gray. Um, so what we'll see here is that he uses the orange, the warm color, at a very high intensity. And what surrounds it is a middle intensity cool color. And then what surrounds all of that is a very low intensity warm color or palette. And then above all of that, we have a low intensity cool um, palette being used for the, for the sky. So this is a very, very simple little painting, uh, but you can tell it's been very, very well thought through. Um, and so, Rosario, if you're watching this again, I'd love to have a glass of wine with you sometime when I'm in Texas. But uh, this, your work is absolutely gorgeous. I, I, I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate your effort. I appreciate the time that it takes you to, to, to uh, render these things out. Um, and just, just an overall great job, man. Great job. So that is the end of episode four of the Core 80. Um, but like I've promised you before, I'm going to talk about the Core 80 at every single uh, video. And why would I do that? Well, for a bunch of reasons. But the point, the, the, the reason why I'm doing the Core 80 call is because I want to daily bark it. I want to every day make sure that the dog of composition is barking and by sending out these videos by sending out this vibe by sending out this uh, intention and this focus my hope is that the artists who are sensitive enough to hear it and also are self-aware enough to realize it um, that these messages get to them so please if if you like this video, if you like these videos, over the next 96 uh, days, I guess, we're going to be 95 days actually, because i got to do it uh, today's video later. So over the next 95 days, form a habit of sharing these videos with your community. Share it in your groups. Share it in your Facebook fan page. Share it on your profile page. Um, you can copy it because I have it set to public. So you can copy the URL and, and put in URL and send it over to your email list, whatever it is. If you think these videos are valuable, share them with your community, share them with other artists, um, because that's what we're going to be doing. We're, we're focusing on our 80, our core 80, uh, after December 31st, 2016. Um, we're closing the doors to the academy. So if you want to be part of the academy, if you want to become a master at this kind of, uh, uh, of insight and this kind of uh, skills, then you need to get started ASAP because come uh, the end of 2006, we're shutting the doors for a year. And we're just going to focus on the people that are there. Um, if there's more than 80, then that's great too. So, but our, our focus is that that core 80 before we end up getting into our center 300 and then our 2500s after that. So I know I've said a lot, uh, 
And because it's 530 in the morning and I've been up for almost four hours, I'm actually starting to slightly feel it's time for me to go to sleep. <laughs> so, um, yes, I am very, very happy I was able to do this video. I hope you guys enjoy it, let you learn, and when you go back to your studio, um, I hope you take some of these uh, ideas and messages and, and what I'm communicating with you so that you can go actually apply it in your own work. So on that note, uh, I am going to say ciao. I am signing off. And that is number four of the core 80 in the books. We're going to call that done. <laughs> see you later today. And then I'll see you tomorrow as well. All right.